Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the last show of 2023. So Kevin was on on the Christmas Eve show. We're here to bust the myth. And the, the myth that we're going to look at today is that General Patton predicted the Battle of the Bold before everybody else. And there we are. So uh, I'll bring Kevin in. Good afternoon, sir. Hey, oh, how are you nice doing, Yeah, <laughs> you weren't wearing that a minute ago when we were chatting. I always like to surprise you a little bit, man. That's what I got to do. Well, yeah, yeah. I was outdone by I think it was uh, it was um, Trevor's. Uh, no, it was um, uh, Ed, uh, Richard's um, Tam O'Shanter that did was the best hat on the Christmas Eve. Anyway, so pattern. Um, there's lots of myths, but we're just talking. You can come back on and do a, a pattern myth every week, probably. Much. He's the kind of figure that these stories just hover around. He started some. He's himself, and then this whole creation largely based on the on the movie but let's look at it i'll bring up the powerpoint so there we are did Patton predict the battle of the bulls uh, a world war ii myth are we going to say it's it, it's true are we going to debunk it thoroughly or is the truth in the middle over to you kevin to kind of talk for the next 15 20 minutes so and uh tell me when to nudge on the slides sure uh we're going to totally debunk this one and it's one that i was a student of for decades you know i loved writing about it talking about Patton's ability to read a battlefield better than anybody else. There is General Patton uh, driving around the front in his Jeep. He always kept a blanket over his legs. It was so cold uh, in the winter time. But um, so this idea that Patton predicted the bulge, this goes to his typed diaries that were given, that were allowed to be seen by Blumenson and Carlo Deste and a lot of other authors. Uh, Beatrice, Patton's wife, kindly typed up his diaries, because his his handwriting was chicken scratch, as we're about to see. Um, but she embellished the diary incredibly mm -hmm. as she did it. And so we're going to see one of the most egregious uh, elements of her embellishment in those diaries. And like I said, it was something I believed, other historians have believed. Uh, let's go back when I, I want to mention that, you know, I think we got, oh, I thought we had a picture of him with the flag. But yeah, we'll go to the next one. Uh, one of the great. Oh, I, I, I didn't put that one in. It, 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 because it's from a movie still. I did. I, it didn't. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why. Well, this is from a movie still <laughs> that I actually. No, I just didn't. Whatever. We'll camera. do this one. But this is a very famous scene in the movie where uh, Patton has crossed the Saar and he's going to go into Germany, and Omar Bradley calls him, played by Carl Malden, and tells George C. Scott, who we're looking at here, there's some activity going up north. Move Tenth Armored up there. And it cuts to Patton while, you know, inner space uh, cuts with German tanks rolling through the snow to Patton kind of pacing around his headquarters, talking to his staff. And he says something to the effect of, you know, the Germans haven't launched a winter offensive since Frederick the Great. You know, it's not in their nature. Therefore, I predict this is exactly what they're going to do. Like I said, this comes from just about every biography written about Patton after 1954. Uh, the root of it is the, those diaries that I mentioned. So why don't we take a look at one of those diary pages. Next slide. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Like I said, this prediction, and we'll stay on this photo, this prediction comes around November 25th. So a, a good you know, time distance before the bulge. Uh, Patton's wrestling in the mud in the SAR. He's finished with the Mets campaign. He's actually touring the front in this photograph with Henry Hopkins. I'm sorry, Everell Harriman, who is our diplomat to Moscow, and he comes to tour the front, to sh and Patton's going to show him how the mud facing the American armies is just as bad as the Russian mud. He really wants to play this up. And it's from that diary on that day, on the 25th. There we go. Um, so this is a look. We'll, we'll zoom in a little further. But this is the root of everything. And you can see other historians, somebody else penciled under it. Uh, and there's a footnote at the bottom so can we zoom in on that yeah, there? Okay. Yeah. So here it is where uh, you can see it's top further. It says, you know, furthermore, First Army is making a terrible mistake in leaving the Eighth Corps static. This is Middleton's Corps in First Army. As it is highly probable that the Germans are building up east of them. And notice there's that little one. And then it says, on the way to think about these things is to remember what can't be cured must be endured. Bradley is without inspiration. Uh, all for He's all for equality. He also may be jealous. And so anybody not intelligent enough to get, pick up on this clue, you go down to the bottom of the page. And number one, it is opposite Eighth Corps that von Rundstedt broke through 21 days later. Wow. 
is amazing. You know, Patton and his mystic abilities, his, his connection to the other world has told him that it, exactly what events are going to fold, you know, unfold in front of us. So, uh, however, uh, if you go to the handwritten diary, so here it is, you can see the chicken scratch. Um, if you look towards the bottom, you can see the very last line, what can't be cured must be endured. The line above it, uh, it he might, you can see the last word is jealous, talking about yeah. Bradley. He talks about Eisenhower wanting to fight on a large front. Ike, you know, and I, there's some numbers there. It says, you know, um, uh, wants to attack on many fronts and needs more. Nowhere in there is a prediction that the Germans are going to attack on December 16th, 1944. Now, the line does exist. That might sound a little confusing, but that line does exist where Patton says that the Eighth Corps is sitting on its butt or whatever, you know, that they're being static, but it doesn't exist here. Um, so November, Patton finishes with the SAR campaign. He's then called on December 18th, you know, to go to a meeting with Bradley when he realizes that the Germans have broken. Patton is shocked when Pat when Bradley shows him the map of not just how deep the penetration, but how wide it is. And Patton is really caught off guard, but he immediately, you know, clicks into general mode and says, OK, I can start moving these divisions north and do this and that to his credit. You know, and he does brilliantly. Uh, to go on the offensive and, and attack Bastogne. Obviously, the 19th, the next day, is when he has the meeting with Eisenhower, and that's been blown out of proportion too, unfortunately. But getting back to the line that exists, why don't we go to the next slide? Okay, this is from December 27th, the day after Patton relieved Bastogne. And he says, of course, Bradley made a bad mistake by leaving passive the front at the Eighth Corps. So what Beatrice, his loving wife, did is she took this sentence from December 27th, moved it back to November 25th, highlighted it a bit, changed it around a little bit, and turned it into this prediction, making Patton not just a brilliant general, but a prophet. See, I'm good at predicting things after they've happened. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're a genius that way. I, the things you've predicted about World War II are incredible, Paul, on your show. I'm very impressed. Yeah. So so that's Exhibit A. All right. And now I, I and I should stress because I want to sell books that this is all in Volume Two of my. Yes, it's a much more extended, lengthy, scholarly, yeah. cited uh, <laughs> version in the book. There, you're just getting the uh, the, the 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 crib notes today. Yes, and and I like to say that you know. I have the face for radio and a voice for writing. So um, exhibit two. So very famously, um, you know, Patton received intelligence reports from Oscar Koch, his intelligence officer. And it's very well, the story goes that Koch started to see suspicious things at the front too. And he's reporting this all to Patton. And when I, I wanted to reinforce this, I wanted to tell that story. So I pulled all the intelligence records from basically December 1st to December 16th to see the progression of this prediction. Um, it's, it's in Oscar Koch's uh, autobiography. And I think it was Stanley Weintraub said, autobiographies are stories about heroes written by the people that know them the best. And so in Oscar Koch's uh, telling, you know, he sees this build up in Trier and tells Patton, well, anyways, I went to the actual documents and you can see that blue piece of paper. Whenever you get a classified document from the National Archives, you have to get a D-class sticker and put it on there. Um, and so this is December 11th. And there's a reason why I'm using the 11th. Um, these are about 26 page reports. But at the very end of them, this is the summary. And this is the part that the generals would read. And Koch lists the capabilities of the enemy. These reports cover the terrain, the weather, what all the units under Patton are up to. But at the very end, they break down exactly what the Germans are capable of. And so it says the enemy is capable of defending and delaying from prepared positions in an effort to block our advances attacking on the Siegfried line. The enemy is capable of counterattacking locally with infantry and armor, particularly in our main efforts, in an effort to contain those advances and continue uh, to resist and assault the fortifications. 
The enemy is capable of a general withdrawal, and the enemy is capable at any time of reinforcing against any section of the zone of advance. And then very bottom conclusion, they think the capabilities of one, two, and four are the most capable, or what to predict. Mm. Nowhere in there does they say do they say the Germans are capable of a major counterattack. In fact, um, in the actual diaries and letters, yes, Koch does go to Patton at one point and says, there's a buildup in Trier. And Patton says, well, what does it mean? And he goes, I don't know. And he goes, okay, well, we're, we're busy with our offensive. So here it is. These are the exact documents. Now, I said this is no December 11th. Why am I, so what I did is I studied them all. If you go to the one for December 16th, which I think is the next slide. No, the next slide is the, uh, unless I didn't put it in there, the photo. Nope. All right, we'll go back to these slides. The, and I'll just say, explain that on the, on the intelligence report for December 16th, under capabilities, it says, see December 11th. So it was so repetitive, they didn't even bother typing it up anymore. Right. They just said, see previous doc. You know, so that tells you that no, they're not expecting it. They don't expect anything from the Germans, anything different from what they're talking about in early December. So I mean, there, that's piece two. We got David Ultra O'Keefe is watching, and you know he's you know with hindsight you can see that the pieces of the puzzle were there. It's that nobody at that time could see what the actual puzzle was. It's the same thing we had with the. Roosevelt knowing about Pearl Harbor. Obviously, there were clues the Japanese were going to go on the offensive. There were there had been all sorts of warnings and things like that, but the actual specifics of an attack at Pearl Harbor were not known. It seems the same thing applies to this. There is obviously something brewing. There is the Germans are on in preparation for something, but when, where, how, what size, that becomes different. And let's talk about Pearl Harbor and Battle of Bulge here, comparing them. Pearl Harbor, we're, we're a military, we're a country at peace. Yeah. So we're not thinking on a warlike structure, like what is the enemy capable? What are they going to do to us? How are we going to counterattack? Things are going on. We don't want to overreact. You know, uh, Pearl Harbor is like, we don't want to start a war. We want the war to come to us, you know? And so we're at that peaceful mind. December of 1944, we've got the enemy on the run. They're exhausted. We're pretty exhausted. We've established a very strong line. When the weather gets better, we were going to go on these great offensives and clean the war out. So in both cases, we're suffering both a combination of ignorance and hubris. So yeah. the clues are there and nobody suspects a thing. And give the Japanese and the Germans credit. They knew what they were doing. They knew how to conceal. They knew how to throw out other things. Like, you know, they were flying planes over the front to disguise the noise. When guys were reporting it to the, the green units are reporting saying, hey, we hear a lot of noise on the other enemy side. That's normal. Don't make well, it. That came up in the show with the 20 about with Walter about the 28th division is that I think by 44, the allies have come to believe they're the ones who do deception and and that kind yeah. of intelligence. And that the Germans are hopeless. But the Germans are learning from the allies. The Germans are learning that deception can, can be a, a valuable tool on the battlefield. So just because we we the Allies have got good at something doesn't mean that the enemy can't also pull these rabbits out of hats at times. And the German, you know, the, the Battle of the Bulge is the example of the, you know, the Germans and the and the, the noise and artillery noises that they 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 play us at our own game in some ways. Yeah. And the Germans have been doing it since 1940. That yeah. they were able to take Belgrade by bluffing. You know, they did a number of things all over the Eastern Front. Uh, and they, that's how they invaded France. They said, oh, no, we don't really want to fight you guys. And then bang. So yeah. they are experts at this stuff. And yeah, we, like I said, it's a case of hubris where we are the masters yeah. of the battlefield. We're the ones dictating how the battles are going to go. And we're not. You know, so the enemy been... always gets a vote. Andreas asked, when was the uh, the uncorrected diary released, uh, declassified? Right. So I asked the, um, so the, the folks at the Library of Congress told me when we, when you know we were, I was discovering this and it was very much with their help during the pandemic they they created something called the we the people program where they asked volunteers to translate diaries and letters and someone and they said it was a little controversial they said let's do patent and they said geez the racism might be really bad but they went ahead and did it anyways and put it up all online and when I talked to the staff they said yeah when there was a specific line when the Patton family gave this material to the Library of Congress. They said, we don't want anybody looking at the written diaries. We just want them seeing the type ones. 
when that changed, I don't know, but I know that that's the rules Blumenson was working on. Mm. You know, and another um, question from David about about the amendments that that his wife made is: Are we sure she was the one who did the doctoring? It appears that somebody would have uh, really have to have an understanding of his geography. Could it be another historian working on her behalf? Well, I would say that she was a very good historian because Patton's writing her every other day letters of what's going on at the front. So she was acutely aware. Now, having said that, two of Patton's staff officers helped her with the transcriptions. Right. And you can see the evidence of sort of score settling. There's a lot of mention of, and I mentioned this before, and it's in the book, you know, General Lee, the, uh, the basically the supply officer for Eisenhower, he comes to visit Patton one day and Patton says, oh, this guy's a real SOB. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's terrible. And then you look at the actual diary and says, Lee visited today. Boom. So I, I feel like there was a lot of score settling later in volume three. There's going to be a piece I came across where he basically insults one of his staff officers that's been with him since North Africa, whose name's escaping me. And he says, this guy's worthless and he's an idiot. That's nowhere in the typed up diaries. So they really are sort of protecting their friends, uh, you know, and sticking knives into their enemies. Uh, Beatrice did have a woman helping her with the typing, but I think it was Paul Harkins and Hap Gay uh, who were helping her transcribe these diaries. So not an historian, but definitely Patton fans who had been there and right. were, were really qualified to lie. Which, which, way, which answers, I guess, David, second question, which were either of these staff officers ultra indoctrinated. They they presumably weren't part of the ultra. Correct. So um, an ultra doesn't get declassified till the 1980s. Now, Hap Gay is Patton's chief of staff. I would I would assume he was aware. Um, he's also writing the army diary every day of the, for the third army. Right. Paul Harkins, on the other hand, I don't I, I have no reason to believe he would have had access or knowledge. OK. Well, I've got a few more photos to run through, and then we can maybe just have a little so bit this of one, um, uh, that I actually labeled them for... Re uh, so I wanted to put this picture up because this is the same time period, early December. Patton's kind of visiting the front with uh, Mantinetti, Omar Bradley. There's General Wood right before he gets relieved. And I think that's Bone Steel, the commander. Uh, he, he's a... Um, oh, shoot. I forget what division he's commanding. But he, he's really touring the front at the time. But Patton holds a press conference uh, in early December, and he's asked twice during the press conference, are the Germans capable of a major counterattack? And it's on the record. He says, no, they are not. They are too spent. They do not have the tanks. They don't right. have the manpower for this. So he says out loud in a press conference, the Germans are not capable of any kind of major counterattack. So that's your third third point, basically. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then the final one, uh, this is Saint of Old. And uh, my mentor, Martin Blumenson, postulated that, you know, in his diaries, Patton talks about moving his headquarters to St. of Old, but he keeps holding off from doing it. And Blumenson says this is kind of evidence that Patton knows something is coming and he doesn't want to move his headquarters, you know, to a new location because he knows something big's coming. He wants to stay put. Well, the truth is, yes, he was planning on moving his headquarters there. But as the Germans had pulled out a Saint of Old, and they did this all over the front in late 44, they would put time delayed fuse bombs in mostly federal buildings or, you know, post office or large buildings that could hold troops. And these bombs could be delayed up to a week. And um, who was the uh, staff officer? Uh, Codman. He's driving around with another officer looking at buildings to, to put third, head, third Army headquarters into. And there's this big building on top of a hill. And they're like, that's our baby. Boom, it blows up right in front of them. And they said, okay, maybe not this one. And so <laughs> it's really Patton's fear of occupying a building that's going to blow up underneath him that he keeps delaying. It has nothing to nothing do with, to do the, with battle the battle of the bulge. So fourth so, point. And then we got that, you know, the, the famous photo, of course, of Eisenhower there. Like, so, yeah. Yeah. So um, this is photo was taken in Bastogne in February. Um, and Patton says, you know, oh, Eisenhower just wants a photo op. That's why he's calling me back here. You know, he's really kind of disgusted with the idea. <laughs> what really happened was Eisenhower had a meeting with Bradley and Montgomery, and Bradley was so ticked off at Montgomery for failing to be active during the Battle of the Bulge that he's like, I got, I can't stand this guy. I got to get out of the room. And so they, Eisenhower said, why don't we go to Bastogne? 
And so that's really the reason that that mm -hmm. meeting takes place. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was impossible to find good photos of Patton during the attack north, the first phase of, of the Battle of the Bulge. There's really no photographs of him, much less any action. I, the very few ones I did find I put in the book. It's not until January that you start to see this, uh, uh, you know, great explosion of photographs. Because when the Germans attacked, they kind of put the foot down on a lot of the press and said, you know, no yeah. stories go out for at least 48 hours, no photographs. They really clamp down until they can get the control of the battlefield. And that's why we don't have really a lot of photographic evidence of those. I mean, I'm sure there's nothing of the, the was it the 26th, uh, the Keystone guys that you just did. Yeah. yeah, 28th. You oh, know. yeah, I, I did it. There's there's nothing. There, there's no. photos of them in the hurt gun and there's photos of them at the end of the Ardennes when when they're moving off elsewhere. But during the middle of it, just nothing. Just uh, nothing of the 106, busy. nothing of the 99th. So so that that's really it, Paul. That's the the great... And it's a great story that Patton can predict the bulge coming and everything like that. And I mean, it, tie, it, it ties in with the whole idea of his, you know, reincarnation beliefs and predictions and this spiritual aspect to his career that, that makes him pretty much unique in that regard. There are, there are very few figures I can think of in World War II who have that kind of depth of you know, I say spirituality is not quite the right word, but a greater mystic, thing. mystic kind of... I suppose Hitler, I suppose, you know, what I can think of is in that area. But but a really good question or point from Marks and Sparks about, so is Blumenson's book of Patton's work questionable for research purposes? Because I'm, I'm going to answer that first. I'm going to say no, because Blumenson was a consummate historian. It's just part of the process of a historiography. What's your response? Uh, that, obviously yes. not as good as your books, obviously. Yeah. Clearly. Let's get that well, underlined right away. So Blumenson used, uh, you know, his job was to travel to the different cores get their daily reports, bring them back to Third Army, write, you know, work on the history. So he was, you know, there for a few months, if only two. Um, but it, it, unfortunately, you know, I've seen lots of things in, and I've relied on the patent papers like nobody's business. Yeah. But when it comes to World War II, yeah, I hate to say it. Um, and I, I don't have any plans on creating the, the new diary, you know, as a standalone. But this was my research in nothing but primary sources to tell this story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, you know, we've talked about this before, after all these great wars, American Revolution, the, the, the American Civil War, even wars in Europe, the first people to write about it are the generals who are trying to cover their butts. And the next line are the people defending them. Yeah. And it's not until you get a few generations away that you have historians with access to primary information that can go and find out what, what the real records say. Uh, you know, a good example of that, Peter Caddick Adams mentioned, is George Armstrong Custer, because his yeah. wife basically created a fake bio of him and sold it for decades until she passed away and people started doing the research. So Patton's going, I'm dragging Patton through the same thing. I mean, he... He still comes out as a brilliant general, but just not this mystic. And, and what's so funny, Paul, is, you know, when we study generals, World War II generals, any general, it's always like, well, you know, he went to West Point. He went to all these different service academies, you know, Army War College. But when it comes to Patton, they're like re reincarnation and, you know, read obsessively on different wars. He went through all that same process, too, that made him a good officer. You know, but so that, but that we, we've talked about it before. Patton has that hold over our imagination, our interest, whether we like him or loathe him. You know, and there's other people. I mean, uh, William Nance is going to come on and talk about. Um, I think it's Eddie. You're going to talk about. Um, Matt and Eddie. Yeah, yeah, there's Mar there's Morris Rose and there's there's Wood. All these other people. There Middleton. That they just don't find. Those of us who understand history realize these are influential figures that should be understood more, but they just don't get us excited in that way that Patton does and Monty and MacArthur. And you know, we 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 say we're bored with these subjects, but then we're the first to read all the stuff when it comes out. We're we're you know we're we're caught by our own you know we're caught by the own fascination in this. Yes, and um, that's another thing. Uh, he he's iconic. You know, any movie about Europe and World War II, you're going to hear his name. Uh, what was that? The first Captain America movie. The yeah. colonel says, General Patton said, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like. Well, I, I had lunch with Helen Patton. You know, our mutual friend, Patton's yep. gone today. So I've just come back from spending time with Helen today. And I don't want to kind of talk about, but the, the, her, her and her, 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 her partner have 
uh, some hotel interest in Sweden, and someone's saying there, say, can you bring the pattern name into the hotel? It's like, in Sweden? I mean, even in Sweden, they kind oh, yeah. of want to bring the pattern name in because it's – and she's like, I'm in Sweden because I don't want to talk about general pattern right now. This is me, Helen, a business – so, you know, pattern – is an it's a brand it's it, you get to that point where it becomes more than just the person Patton means something to people there's a statue of him in czechoslovakia there's another monument to him in czechoslovakia um sweden is where he was in the olympics in, in he was in the olympics there yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and um you know it's just people want to attach their names to him in fact he was a general casey a u.s army general contacted me at one point he said, hey, I stayed in this chateau in France, and the guy said Patton was here on these dates. Is that right? And I said, no, he hadn't reached that town yet, and he's never mentioned it in his diaries. He had a mobile headquarters. No, but people use that to sell hotels. You know, I mean, it's just everywhere. And well, I mean, it's, it's the Stratford upon Avon thing, is that Shakespeare's dogs, dentists, best friends, neighbor slept here, you know, and and uh, it, that's it, it sells it, it it creates interest it creates a buzz and, and whether we like it or not channels like world war two tv and history underground it's the patterns it's spitfires it's dam busters it's the midway it's the doodle ray will that will always drive people uh forward it's band of brothers it's semi right and then beyond that we have to get people down to these other people and understand things and but there we will bring things and although we could on keep chatting we want people to watch these shows so these myth shows are meant to be short so kevin We'll bring you back in. People said there's more myths, and we'll talk about pattern after Cobra. There's pattern we can talk about uh, all sorts of things, conspiracies, myths. We'll debunk them in 2024. I'm ready. Well, cheers, then, folks. I will see you all again. I haven't scheduled the shows for for the first week of January, but I'll be doing that in the next couple of days. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for your uh, views. Thanks for your comments. Thanks for your questions. I will see you all after New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. Bye. Happy New Year. <laughs>